Hi, everybody. Aaron Stein here, Chief Content Officer at War on the Rocks. And what follows is a sneak preview of one of our members-only podcasts, Unspent Rounds, where on this one, I sat down with Philip Zelico to talk about the feasibility and the legality of seizing Russian assets. And the reason we're doing this is, one, to give you all a sneak preview of what it is that you can get if you become a member at War on the Rocks, but two, because of the news that the United States has put forward a G7 plan to seize $300 billion in Russian assets. And with that, let's kick the intro music and get going. Have you ever been talking to someone so interesting that you didn't want the conversation to end? Welcome to Unspent Rounds, a members-only podcast from War on the Rocks that features interesting conversations with interesting people. It's hosted by me, Aaron Stein, Chief Content Officer, and my friend Ryan Evans, founder of War on the Rocks. Let's get to it. Hello and welcome to Unspent Rounds, where today I'm talking with Philip Zelico, who is a senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Philip, it's good to have you on the show. Glad to be with you. So the reason I wanted to have you on today is that there has been a lot of talk and I think a lot of chatter about what to do with Russian assets that are stored in Western banks. This is, I think, going to become more salient as people start to grapple with the challenges of yet another winter at war. There was a recent foreign policy piece, you know, basically pointing out that not a lot of people have thought about this. And I think your retort in an email was a lot of people have actually thought about this, which is the challenges of what to do with them and all of that stuff. So perhaps I can tee you up right there. What do you think about this chatter that's going on about Russian assets stored in foreign banks amidst the Ukraine war? Well, it's a lot more than chatter. I've been involved on this issue now for since six weeks after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I've been involved in discussions about this with a number of governments at a very professional level. So people, a number of people have been working this issue very hard. There are some outsiders who kind of discover this issue and, and comment on it, but who have not really done the analysis on either the international law, international finance, or the policy side. But hey, folks have opinions. Reasons, opinions. Uninformed analysis, uh, if you're not being charitable, but because you have been working on this, you know, what are the ins and outs of this issue for those of our listeners who are trying to catch get up to speed, uh, probably in the new year here? Sure. Here's the fundamental point. The center of gravity in the war is not the battle line. The center of gravity in the war is the economic, financial, social viability of Ukraine. Since the failure of the initial offensive, Russia's strategy has been to wreck Ukraine if they can't have it. And they've been doing a reasonable job of wrecking Ukraine. Therefore, the the counter strategy is to defeat the Russian strategy of wrecking Ukraine and wrecking their hopes. You have the theory of victory here is a theory in which Ukraine can not only survive, but it can thrive no matter where the final battle line finally ends up. That means you actually have to focus your attention on the basic economic viability of Ukraine, regardless of where the final battle line ends up, as long as the Ukrainians can mount their defense. All right, so center of gravity of the war is actually really the war economy in a war of attrition. Then you realize that through a a unique circumstance of history, the Russian aggressor left a game-changing war chest of money in the hands of the countries wounded by its aggression. That has never happened before. The Russian government left, at the time it invaded Ukraine, more than something in the neighborhood of $300 billion and slash euros in the accounts of law-abiding states that are opposed to the Russian aggression. Under international law, Russia is actually legally accountable to compensate all the victims of its aggression. Under international law, states are entitled to take countermeasures in which, because of Russia's outlaw behavior, states are free to violate their normal obligations to Russia in order to take countermeasures to compensate the victims of Russia's aggression. 
This is not sanctions. This Sanctions are where you decide not to do business with someone. Countermeasures are where you do things that ordinarily would be a violation of international law, but you're entitled to do them because of the target state's prior violations of international law that are extreme. The target state has to have done things that are violations of the most core tenets of international law, which Russia unquestionably has done. That's been a finding of the International Court of Justice, multiple UN resolutions, and so on. So center of gravity in the war, economic viability of Ukraine. Core to the strategy is hundreds of billions of dollars of money that has been frozen since the Russian invasion, lying inert and useless with no plausible scenario of how it will ever go back to Russia, and an international law situation that entitles countries that hold this money to transfer those assets for the benefit of Russia's victims, primarily Ukraine. This is an amount of money that would allow you to finance a monumental European recovery program anchored in Ukraine's recovery that provides you with a theory of victory for Ukraine, regardless of the position of the final battle line, and would smooth the way towards Ukraine's accession into the European Union, which then represents a true defeat of the Russian aggression and its original goals. Hi, everybody. Aaron Stein here, just taking a minute from my own conversation with Philip to remind you to join War on the Rocks Platinum, our membership program. If you sign up, you get access to newsletters from In Brief, which is once a week updates on global events with experts in 100 words or less, to the adversarial, which comes out every other week and is analysis on America's adversaries, to mid-afternoon map, which is our very own Nick Danforth's cartographic perspective on geopolitics, to rewind and reconnoiter, where we get together with War on the Rocks authors, talk about old articles and what they mean in light of recent global events, to our excellent podcasts, one of which you're listening to right now, Unspent Rounds, which is interesting conversations with interesting people. And we also have Anka Pandas Thinking the Unthinkable, which is really interesting conversations about the third nuclear age. And of course, Michael Kaufman's Russia Contingency, where you can dive deep on all things Russia, all things Soviet, from military to history, and even more granular analysis about the war in Ukraine. Sign up today at warontherocks.com slash membership. And with that, back to the show. So for people, let's say, who are just catching up to this, I think some people are going to ask, why is it that Russia has money in Western banks? And I, I think a lot of people will understand that. And then yeah. two is this idea of freezing and then seizing. Uh, I know you've been working on this for a while. What are the pushbacks or the counters to your argument that you hear about this from, say, government officials or perhaps policy analysts who have a, a different point of view you remember, you know all that money that Russia was earning by selling oil and gas? People don't pay for that oil and gas in rubles. They pay for that oil and gas in euros and dollars. So Russia piles up hundreds of billions worth of euros and dollars. You can't hold, the only place you can hold foreign currencies is in a bank of the state that issued that currency. So if you want to hold lots and lots of euros and dollars, you have to hold that money in a bank from a country that issues euros or issues dollars. There are some particular things having to do with offshore dollar and euro accounts, but it's, it's not important for our discussion. So all this, all, all this money, therefore, is held in banks of G, basically of G7 countries plus Switzerland. Uh, G7 includes the European Commission and the European Union. And quite a, uh, the majority of it is held in Europe, and the majority of what's in Europe happens to be held in a central securities depository, a clearinghouse called Euroclear, which is based in Brussels. But that's just, that's just because that's a suitable clearinghouse. Mo- the large majority of this money is now held in cash, and this is, these are assets of the Russian state. So let me make clear this. We're not talking about oligarch money. We're not talking about seizing people's yachts. We're talking about uh, accounts that are held in accounts of the Central Bank of Russia. So this is a direct countermeasure, and Russian state money will now be used 
to compensate the victims of Russia's aggression by the states that opposed this aggression and froze that money um, under the international law of state countermeasures. Now, there was an immediate neuralgic response to this because like, whoa, like surely there's some reason you can't do this. And actually, because folks, even though the international law of state countermeasures has been around for a long time, it has not been applied on this scale before, and it has not been applied very recently. It was applied, for example, against Iraq after its invasion of Kuwait in 1990 in order to seize and transfer Iraqi government assets, more than $50 billion worth in 1990 dollars. And that more than $50 billion was then seized and transferred in order to compensate the victims of Iraqis, Iraq's aggression, which was mostly Kuwait and Kuwaitis, but not all. About 10 other countries got compensated. There are, other, there, there are a number of other precedents. I've joined with um, seven other international lawyers, among them the most highly regarded international lawyers in the world, with extensive practice in the International Court of Justice, mostly from Europe, as well as Japan and Nigeria. And all eight of us have written a lengthy memorandum that, in which we all agree that the that international law allows you to go forward. So then one of the arguments that got made was, okay, doesn't this violate some sort of state immunity? And this is a very, con this is a source of a lot of confusion. A lot of people, including international lawyer, international law professors, have heard of sovereign immunity. What they don't understand is that sovereign immunity is a doctrine that has to do with the jurisdiction of courts. It is a doctrine that limits the ability of how much courts can play the role of a sovereign in doing things to another country's assets, issuing judgments against them and so on. So sovereign immunity is a doctrine that basically limits how much courts can usurp the role of a sovereign state in going after another sovereign state. In a case like this, where the sovereign state would be going after another sovereign state, sovereign immunity doesn't arise at all. That's it. There's no courts, and this is an active state. There is no immunity between one sovereign and another. The Russian state isn't immune from an action by another sovereign. It, under international law, the way this works is this. If I take, I can take your sovereign property, I can seize your company, I can take your stuff. If I do that unlawfully, you would then be entitled to demand compensation from me for my having taken your stuff. And under international law, if we took the Russian assets, or even froze them for that matter, Russia could demand compensation if that was unlawful. The reason that Russia can't demand compensation in this case is because of the international law of state countermeasures, uh, if, it, if we're saying Russia is precluded from complaining of the unlawfulness of your action because Russia is, was, was an outlaw itself, Russia's prior illegal behavior triggered your countermeasure in return. Therefore, Russia is not entitled to compensation. But you see, the People talk about sovereign immunity without really understanding how that doctrine works in a case like this and that it really doesn't apply and that Russia can't get compensation from us because of Russia's own outlaw behavior. One of the other confusions here, too, is that, well, won't this disturb the international financial system? That is, uh, won't, won't people quit holding stuff in dollars and euros? If you really do the analysis on this, the answer is very simple. If the G7 countries act together, there's no place to go if you want to be in the world economy. If we act together, that's dollars, euros, sterling, yen. Well, right there, I've just now named the currencies in which 93% of all foreign exchange holdings are held. 93 now, you could say, well, gee, won't they then move their money into renminbi instead? Or, I don't know, Bitcoin. 
gold doesn't help you very much because you can't buy stuff with gold bars. You have to turn it into a currency first. Well, right now, RMB makes up 3% of foreign exchange holdings. So you're taking a common action that involves 93%, and it's not like people are then going to all run to the three. By the way, most of the people, most foreign exchange is actually held by countries that are allies or partners of the United States. And there are reasons why Arab countries, for example, don't keep all their money in renminbi and why they prefer to settle trades in dollars. Renminbi is not a, an incredibly secure place to park your money either. So renminbi holdings have gone up a little bit, but by gone up, we mean like they've gone from 2% to 3%. So right now, the dollar alone is used in nearly 90% of all foreign trade transactions. So it's true, the Chinese, the political there is political risk here, but the Chinese have recognized that political risk for years. So have the Arabs. They've all been moving their money out of dollars and euros as much as they can. And they've kind of gone about as far on in doing that as they can go, as long as they keep wanting to do business with people who pay in dollars and euros. So I, I think one of the other questions I had, and I know we're, we only have about five minutes left, is you know, it reminds me, and we're, I'm violating a rule of War on the Rocks as I'm bringing in a pop culture reference, which is uh, Hunt for Red October, which is you're talking about a billion pieces of Soviet equipment, they're going to want it back, and that this necessarily won't play out in the courtroom, and that this could be escalatory or viewed out uh, or viewed by the Russian state as escalatory, prompting perhaps more aggressive behavior to take it back in sort of, I'm putting up air quotes on our chat box here. What do you say to those people who would say that this would just incentivize them to do more unlawful behavior? I would say to them, you're right. And it already has, and they already have. Again, this is stuff that your audience may not be very familiar with. First, of course, Russia already believes it's at war with the West and says so. And it's, it, let me just say, they're doing what they can. So one of the things they did uh, earlier this year, in fact, is they, uh, they basically said, uh, we see that you've frozen all these assets of ours. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to adopt a presidential decree, which they did in April, in which we're going to take as hostages all private investments and private companies in Russian jurisdiction. Now, notice I said private. See, what we're only going after is Russian state assets because of Russian state behavior. They're going after private companies like, say, Danone Yogurt, Carlsberg. So what they did is they put in this decree that says we are now entitling ourselves as our state countermeasure to basically seize and confiscate all your private investments and private companies. And then just to show you we mean it, we're going to kill a few of the hostages to show we're serious. So the Russians ostentatiously basically confiscated everything that Danone had in Russia, everything that Carlsberg Beer had in Russia, in order to show they could do it, and then turn those over to Chechen cronies, Putin, said, here, all this is yours now. And then, by, like, and hear this, and so watch German companies, Japanese country companies. We can do this to the rest of you, too. This was their way of encouraging Germany and Japan not to go along with transferring the assets. The, the Russians uh, have, have made that threat, and so uh, we, we need to go ahead. And, of course, the, the, the amount of dollar and euro stakes left by these companies in Russia, and they've already a lot of companies have already written down or, or written off their remaining investments in Russia. And those that haven't now know they're hostage. And what will happen is, is I believe Russia will retaliate against these companies. That's unlawful, by the way, for them to do that. But the companies haven't done anything wrong. Nonetheless, they will do that. And these companies then will then join the list of claimants who will be seeking compensation for the damages from Russia's unlawful behavior. So when we form the, when you form the pot of money made up of the hundreds of billions of dollars to compensate for the injury, both with urgent programs and with a claims process, companies like these foreign companies Russia may liquidate will then join the lists of those claimants. So yes, Russia can retaliate. Russia's already threatened the retaliation, and folks are already then having to adjust the policy to compens basically compensate the, the 
the private hostages that we believe Putin will take and liquidate. Well, uh, I think we're going to have to leave it there because you have to run off to your next meeting. Thank you, uh, Philip, for uh, taking about 20 minutes to talk to us on Unspent Rounds. Let me just conclude by noting that the British government has formally looked at both the legal and financial issues and has now publicly announced, and by the way, that after a thorough examination, yes, this is legal. Yes, this is doable. We're on board. And they have now testified as such to their parliament. I think the United States government is about to do the same. Um, and, a, and a number of the governments in the G7, after months of deliberation, have worked through all these issues, and I think are all now beginning to come to this conclusion. So uh, there's a lot of work that's been done on this in a number of capitals, and I think we can see where this is slowly going. Well, I think if there's any movement on this or further movement on this, I should say we'll have to have you back to talk us through it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Unspent Rounds. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. Spread the word about our membership program at waronthericks.com slash membership. Stay safe and stay healthy.